Jim McKenzie, I'm a retired priest in the Diocese of Northern California, so I'm way far from home. Uh, nice uh, being here. I've been with St. Martin's for a couple of years now. So welcome. The column of the day, Almighty and Everlasting God, yeah. you have given unto us, your servants, grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the Trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity, keep us steadfast in this faith and worship, and bring us at last to see you in your glory, O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our first lesson today is from the book of Genesis. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding the seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters of the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, 
and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with its seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food. And to every beast on the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is Psalm 8. We'll read it together. O Lord, our Governor, how exalted is your name in all the world. Out of the mouths of infants and children, your majesty is praised above the heavens. You have set up a stronghold against your adversaries to quell the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in their courses, what is man that you should be mindful of him, the son of man that you would seek him out? You have made him but little lower than the angels. You adorn him with glory and You give him mastery over the works of your hands and you put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, even the wild beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever walks in the paths of the sea. O Lord our Governor, how exalted is your name in all the world. Our second reading is from the second letter to the Corinthians. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. And remember, I am always with you to the end of the age. A reading from the Gospel of John. Thanks be to God.
The doctrine of the Trinity is drawn out of the biblical revelation centered in the experience of God as creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. That seems simple enough, but to many, it's a little too far from being helpful or conclusive. For why else would so many preachers, theologians, writers quake at the task to be simple? Especially if the task is to explain the three in one of the Trinity. Well, we also acknowledge that word Trinity is not found in Holy Scripture. Most of us have a pretty solid grasp of God as creator. You just heard the creation account. We also acknowledge that the word Trinity is not found in Holy Scripture. But look around and see the magnificence of the created order. Sun, moon, and the planets in their courses. In much the same way we know about Jesus as the Redeemer, the head of the church, who sent the Advocate on Pentecost to bestow upon us the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is where we begin as we try to absorb the meaning of the divine power that we cannot see or hear. For most of us then, to appreciate the Holy Spirit is a challenge. But this is the challenge we face on Trinity Sunday. And while so many preachers, seminarians, etc., quake if they have to preach on Trinity Sunday because it is a difficult thing to understand. In much the same way we know about Jesus as Redeemer, the head of the church, the advocate upon Pentecost to bestow upon us the gift of the Holy Spirit, as I just said. That is where we are as we begin to absorb the meaning of the divine power that we cannot see or hear. For most of us then, to appreciate the Holy Spirit is a challenge. Anne Spivak wrote in Reader's Digest, While our friends from India traveled around California on business, they left their daughter with us. Curious about my going to church one Sunday, she decided to come along. When she returned, my husband asked her what she thought of the service. I don't understand why the West Coast isn't included too in the prayers, she replied. You know, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the whole East Coast. Uh, that little bit of levity out of the way, let's begin with this wisdom from Herbert O'Driscoll, an Anglican priest, hymn composer, and theologian. O'Driscoll writes, We do not think about the Trinity so much as experience it. Only then do we understand. And here is the par paradox that we understand the Trinity most when we realize that we do not understand. The first experience of the Holy Spirit was when the apostles caught a glimpse of the Spirit at Pentecost as they fanned out into the streets of Jerusalem and then throughout the whole of the Roman Empire. As this expansion of the faith solidified, differences of understanding emerged. It took centuries to have most of the whole church in agreement. What we now know as the apostles and Nicene creeds took years to settle. And this was guided by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, while we may not understand every aspect of the Spirit's movements, we do know that one crucial area of the Spirit's presence is how the faith is protected in faith, in truth. While there are many theories or theologies, not all are faith-filled or edifying or biblically sound. And just to step aside for a moment, People generally don't declare themselves heretical. They're basically uh, called that by people who didn't agree with them. So we're spending some time on this day that we commemorate and remember the, uh, the Trinity. Uh, let's be careful that we don't condemn anybody for their knowledge of the truth. So, therefore, knowledge of how the Holy Spirit guided 
guides us and manifests to us protecting the church. It's important, but it's not what is most important. As the fiscal points out, it is how we experience it, not how much we understand. In the year 1273, a Dominican philosopher and theologian completed his Summa Theologica, that's 20, 30 treatises, 3,000 articles, and 10,000 objectives. It was a massive undertaking, and Pope Pius V officially declared Thomas Aquinas a doctor of the church. But one day in 1273, he had an experience of the Holy Spirit and stopped writing and researching. As the psalmist said, his knowledge is too wonderful for me. Thomas had a beatific vision and returned to monastic life, not to write again, ever. So here is another approach that took root as part of the evolving theology of what we call Pentecostalism and how the Holy Spirit pours out divine love upon us and Christ's church. This approach was adopted in 1914 by the emergence of the Evangelical Pentecostal movement and came to be known as the Jesus Only movement. Sometimes, oh, that page ahead of myself. The Jesus Only movement also known as the Oneness Pentecostalism, or Oneness Theology, teaches that there is only one God, but denies the triunity of God. In other words, Oneness Theology does not recognize the distinct persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It has various forms. Some see Jesus Christ as the one God, who sometimes manifests himself as the Father or the Holy Spirit. The core doctrine of oneness Pentecostal, Jesus only, is that Jesus is the Father and Jesus is the Spirit. There is one God who reveals himself in different modes. This teaching of the Jesus only oneness Pentecostals has been around for centuries in one form or another. It's been called modalism. Modalism teaches that God opened and operates in different forms or modes at different times, sometimes as the Father, sometimes as the Son, and sometimes as the Holy Spirit. But passages like Matthew 3, 16 to 17, where two or all three persons of the Trinity are present, contrast the modalistic view. Modalism was condemned as heretical as early as the second century AD. The early church strongly contended against the view that God was singular a person who acted in different forms at different times. They argued from scripture that the triunity of God is evident in that more than one person of the Godhead is often seen simultaneously and they often interact with one another. Examples would be Genesis 1, 26, 3, 22, Psalm 2, 7, Matthew 18 and 19, John 14 and 16. Oneness Pentecostalism, Jesus' only doctrine, is unbiblical. It sounds good, and it's not an explanation that makes sense or has any support in Holy Scripture. The concept of the triunity of God, on the other hand, is present throughout Scripture. It is not a concept that is easily grasped by the finite mind. And because people like everything to make sense in their theology, movements such as the Jesus Holy Movement, not to mention the Jehovah's Witnesses, regularly arise to try to explain the nature of God. Of course, this is simply something that cannot be done without doing violence to the biblical texts. 
Christians have to come to accept that God's nature is not subject to the limitations that we like to put on him. We simply believe him when he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. If we and my thoughts are not your thoughts, if we can't understand his thoughts and ways, we therefore accept that we cannot fully understand his nature either. After Pentecost and the coming of the Spirit, the word God was simply not adequate to describe the apostles' experience. The basis of faith had to be widened. Faith seeking understanding had to be stretched. No longer would a strict monotheism work as people sought to describe a threefold activity of relationship with the one God. Over time, the apostolic community handed down and mediated to the world an experience of God under three aspects of the divine personality. This undivided God could and did do the work that defines what we mean by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is, is the work of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, all in one, a community of three persons, distinct and powerful. Ultimately, the Trinity is not something that can be fully explained. Only God knows God. God's self is incomprehensible. Pascal wrote, by faith we know of God's existence. In glory we shall experience God's nature. Until then, let us affirm the Nicene Creed, make the sign of the cross over ourselves, and bless everything in the name of the Holy Trinity. And also take note of the words of Vincent Van Gogh. The best way to know God is to love many things. Now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be ascribed by God's most justly due, all power by majesty and dominion, now and forever. Amen. Come Holy Spirit. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our prayer for St. Martin's. God of love, open our eyes and ears to perceive you at work in creation, the church, and our parish. Fill our hearts with your love, that we may reach out in love to others. Stir up our imagination with your Holy Spirit, that we may find new ways to live into life with you. Give us a vision of your mission, that we may share your love and your spirit in all the places where we work and play and worship you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. And now may the grace of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia. 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 Alleluia.